1 Kings chapter 2. The father of five small children was in a dilemma. He'd taken the kids to a carnival, and he had actually won a giant stuffed animal. And so now he's got to decide who's going to get the stuffed animal. Five kids, you know, which one gets it? So he called the children around. He said, all right, children, gather around. He said, now, who always obeys mommy the first time she speaks? Who does everything that mommy says? They're all looking at each other, trying to decide, and they said, you keep it, daddy. <laughs> well, sometimes the husbands do more obeying than the children do, don't they? And I got thinking about parenthood. I always wanted five. I thought it would be great. I always wanted one in a big family. I thought five was big, but, you know, six, whatever we got, that would be great. We always said, whatever the Lord gives us, that would be wonderful. Well, for the longest time, we only had two kids. And we, had the, we told you about the one we lost in 2003. And I thought that was it. And then 10 years between Heather and this one we just had, and now we've got another one. So we got a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a baby, a one-month-old. And you know, one of the greatest joys of my life is being a father, being a dad. It's, a, it's an honor. It's a privilege. The Bible says that God has set the solitary in families. And out of his kindness, one of, the, one of the greatest things that we have in the world is the relationship of family. And if your family knows the Lord, you know all, how, how much more precious that is. It's the way God intended it. And I want to talk about family tonight. I especially want to talk about fathers. My dad went to be with the Lord two and a half years ago, May of 2008. I remember distinctly, it was one of those memorable family times in our lives. Angela and I were about to celebrate our 15th anniversary. And when you travel in full-time evangelism, you know, we, we drive every weekend somewhere. We've been all over the world. So we're, what are we going to do for a 15th anniversary? Well, we've been saving up money from birthdays and Christmas and such. We thought, we'll take a cruise. We've never done a cruise, so we thought that'd be pretty neat, and then we don't have to drive ourselves. So, and we thought of a cruise to Alaska. I hadn't been to Alaska at that point, and I thought this would be a great thing. So, saved up for a couple of years thinking this is, this is going to be it. And, and some friends of ours have the exact same wedding date and year as we, so they, he's a pastor. So we were going to go together with them and thought this would be great. So, the week leading up to the cruise, um, I'm in, uh, where was I at the time? I was back at home in Kansas City. And I was doing a meeting over on the opposite side of the state line in Kansas. Our friends had already gone up to Washington State. They were waiting for us. And I remember it was Tuesday night. We were going to meet up there on a Saturday. Tuesday night. And my sister calls. It's 9 o'clock at night. 10 o'clock, her time, East Coast. And I said, Jen, what's happening? I just left the meeting that night. I just finished preaching. She said, Rich, I don't know how to tell you this, but we lost Dad tonight. Well, my sister's a nurse, and she and her husband had both done CPR and my dad. And, well, you can imagine when you're the, you know, you're the emergency caregiver and you know he's not going to make it. She said, I know I broke ribs trying to save dad's life, but she said, uh, he's going to be with the Lord. He was 65 years old. And I, we think it might have been a blocked bowel. He'd had some internal problems that way over the years. And so that was shocking news. Ten minutes later, after I hung up, I just found out this news. Our dear friends who are waiting for us up in Alaska call and say, uh, hey, guys, oh, we just, it's so beautiful in Washington State, and we're just looking forward to you coming, and so are you excited? And I said, well, Tammy, um, I picked up the phone for Angela because I, I figured I should be the one to tell you this, but we just lost my dad tonight. <gasps> oh, no, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, you know, it's okay, because I know where my dad is. He's the one that led me to trust the Lord as my Savior. And he wasn't trusting his own goodness to get him to heaven. He wasn't trusting his own self-righteousness. He was trusting fully in the Lord. And I, I said, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to make this trip. In fact, Saturday when we're supposed to be heading out on the cruise, I'm going to be conducting the funeral. And I remember standing before my dad's open casket and somebody asked me, are you going to be able to do that? Yes, by the grace of God. And all these relatives that I had prayed for for years, I had the opportunity to give the gospel to them. And two days after the funeral, I had the privilege of leading my cousin to Christ. He was 50 years old, had never been married. And I just saw him last week. He is growing in grace. He's, he's faithful in his local church. He's just on fire for the Lord. And he got saved as a result of my dad's funeral. And you know, I've thought back to what was the last thing I said to my dad before he died? Because I've met, I've met kids over the years. They said, you know, I... 
they, they live with these regrets because they spoke something hateful to one of their parents and then the mom or dad died suddenly. Well, it was an unexpected death in my family too. And I was scrambling to think, what was the last thing I said to my dad? And you know, I know what it was. Because it was the habit of my life. Whenever I talked to my dad, which is weekly, we'd talk, and he was in my wedding, and uh, he's my best man in my wedding. You know, we were real close. Mom and dad both, we'd, we'd talk every week. They let me know what they were praying for me about, et cetera, what's going on. And every time before we hung up, I said, well, Mom and Dad, I love you. And, you know, that started with a Sunday school teacher when I was in ninth grade. He said, young men, you fellas, the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. He says, one of the ways you can do that is expressing your love for your parents. And he said, I want to challenge you. You ought to tell your parents that you love them, and you ought to tell them every day. Well, at that point, I told you my testimony yesterday. I was a big-time heavy metal headbanger, and I was a rebel, and I had just started going to a good church, and I knew what he was saying was true. But, boy, was that awkward when you've been really rebellious and I remember the night that I apologized to my parents for the wrong that I'd done. And I said, Mom, Dad, I want you to know something. Um, not only am I very sorry for the hurt that I've caused you, but I want you to know that I love you. That became the habit of my life. And any time I talked to my parents, I always made sure when we hung up, Dad, I love you. Mom, I love you. So I have no question the very last thing I said to my dad was that I love him. We're looking tonight at the very last words of David, David, the king of Israel, to his son, Solomon. My dad didn't know when we had that conversation it would be his last conversation. I guarantee you, if my dad had known it was our last conversation, he would have given me some several admonitions because he often did urge me and exhort me in the Lord in a good way. David knew it was about the last time he'd speak to Solomon. And I want you to notice what he said. You just keep your seats tonight, but look at 1 Kings chapter 2. I want to read from verse uh, 1 down to verse 4. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it's written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. David's an old man by this time. In fact, he's feeble. He's so feeble, he, he hasn't been able to retain weight. You remember they, they had that little gal that would cuddle up next to David young virgin woman that was there for one purpose. There was nothing inappropriate about it. She was there because they just could not get heat. There were no electric blankets. And so they put this young woman to attend to David because he was just skin and bones by this time. He's a frail man. And he's admonishing Solomon with some really very sincere exhortation. I want to preach you a simple message tonight, specifically with dads in mind. But ladies, you listen in because you'll get something out of it too. Kids, you listen and you'll get something out of it too. It's a message I call, Do As I Say and As I Do. Do you ever hear from your parent, now you do what I say. In fact, some parents have blatantly said, well, I don't care, just, I don't care what I do. You just do as I say, not as I do. Well, David would say, do as I say and as I do. And that's the goal for any father. I just want to put it on pause here for a minute. Let's, let's ask the Lord to bless the time as we look into his word. Father, the truths that we look at tonight aren't simple, but they are profound. They are truths that have gripped my own heart. Uh, they're truths that I saw exhibited in my dad. And I, have, I want my kids one day to be able to say, my dad was an awesome dad. He loved God with all his heart. He loved us. There was no question about it. Being a tozer was one of the greatest privileges of my life. And I want my kids to know that too. And I pray that for every parent here. There, there may be some moms in here that are thinking, well, I don't have a husband to listen to this. They're, they're raising their kids as single moms. Give them what they need tonight, Lord. There may be some families, they're, they're together. They've stuck together. Perhaps they've stayed together for the kids' sake, but they're not, it's not the marriage that there ought to be. I pray, you'd, I pray you would be their balm of Gilead, heal hurting marriages. There's some families there doing everything they can in their power to see their kids raised rightly, and they love you, and they want so much for the kids to turn out godly. I pray you'd minister to them tonight. There are probably some in here, they're not even part of your family yet. They've not even been saved. Show them what it means to be part of the family of God. 
we can't really understand family life on earth if we don't understand what a heavenly family is all about. So I pray you'd meet each one where he or she is tonight, Lord. It's your power, it's your might that we need, and I ask for that. Holy Spirit, please fill this vessel and work in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing we'll look at is the Father's exhortation. Do as I say. The Father's exhortation to exhort on with words. Notice again what David is saying here. Verse 2, he says, I go the way of all the earth. What does he mean? He's going to die. It happens to everybody. I didn't expect that my dad would die at 65, but I knew he would eventually die. I know that barring the event called the rapture, that I'll die and you'll die. In fact, it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. You know, the sad thing is, there are lots of people who think they've really taken preparation for their family by thinking down the road 10, 20, 30 years. They think, hey, you know, I've got my IRA, I've got my Roth account, I've got, I've got the kids taken care of, I've already filled out my last will and testament, you know, I know how, the, how it's all going to be handled, you know, I've got, my, I've got my life insurance policy, so my little woman's taken care of. And they think they're really thinking down the road. And let me tell you, the Bible says it's appointed to you and me to die once, but after this, the judgment. And how few people there are that think about that. Prepare to meet thy God, the Bible says. I gave you the testimony yesterday about the greatest thing that my dad ever passed on to me was how to be prepared to meet God. The greatest thing you can ever pass on to your children is a spiritual heritage, how to be prepared to meet God. Do you know how to prepare your kids for the day they meet God? If you don't, listen up. We'll talk about that tonight. That was the greatest single thing my dad gave me. You know, my dad was a general contractor. He was never a wealthy man. But boy, I am rich in a spiritual heritage. What I learned from my mom and dad, uh, you couldn't pay in money. I couldn't give its value in money. Here's David. is exhorting Solomon. Verse 3, he says, Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in all his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimony as it's written in the law of Moses. You know, he's mentioning several things. There, there are commandments of the Bible. There are specific statements that are thou shalt, thou shalt not. There are statutes and there are judgments and their testimonies. You know, some things in the Bible are blatantly stated. Other things we learn by principle. So, in other words, sometimes parents say, well, you know, I, I have a hard time really uh, giving my kids some directives when the Bible doesn't really spell everything out. Well, there are Bible principles. And, you know, sometimes uh, I, I heard kids saying when I was in high school, well, you, you know, you can't tell me about my music. The Bible didn't say thou shalt not listen to rock music. That's true. It doesn't. But nor does it say, thou shalt not spike thy hair, cut it in a mohawk, color it purple, green, and orange. Thou shalt not connect thy tongue and thy navel with a chain. It doesn't say that. But, you know, can you figure out some from the Bible, Bible principles about God's view on how we deport ourselves, how we conduct ourselves? Yeah, you can. You know, God doesn't spell out every particular sin. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul writing in the first century, thou shalt not listen to rock music. He puts his pen down and says, rock music, what is that? Well, you know, be like you and me reading in the Bible, thou shalt not in any wise be guilty of, I'll make up a word, zeetbocking. <laughs> what is Yeah, try to spell that one. How, what's zeetbocking, okay? That's a, well, that's a 25th century sin. It hasn't come along yet, has it? <laughs> well, we, don't, we wouldn't know what that is. God does not spell out every particular thing. You know, Apostle Paul writing, thou shalt not watch MTV. He wouldn't have a clue what MTV was. All right? So God does not spell out every particular thing. But I'll tell you what, if you approach the Bible with an open heart and mind, you can know God's specific will on the very challenges of contemporary culture. You can know exactly what God thinks. The key is coming with a surrendered heart. And so David says to Solomon, look, there are statutes and commandments, and there are also judgments and testimonies. And my dad taught me, you have a very tender heart to the things of God. He said, you know, so often the, the human tendency is we just dismiss anything we don't want to hear. And I remember him saying in a Sunday school class, talk about a father's exhortation. One of the most powerful things I learned from my dad beside the matter of salvation. In his Sunday school class, he made this statement one day. Remember this class, only God can please God. I got thinking about that. My dad taught me to you know, interact with him to, when I was wrestling th through something, talk to him about it. I said, Dad, I have a question about what you taught in Sunday school. You said only God can please God. But Dad, what about, you know, in Hebrews it says that Enoch walked with God and he had this testimony that he pleased God. What about, you know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and we're 